if a company wants to be healthy and wants to have the, the closest pulse on the marketplace, marketing and sales have to be in lockstep and have to work cohesively. Thank you for tuning in to the WiseNetX podcast. My name is Daryl. I'm the head of sales here with WiseNetX. And today I've got Tara Baker with me from NEDAP. You know, Tara is a farm kid from Michigan turned agri-marketing guru. She works as the North American marketing manager for NEDAP's livestock business and translating the story of cutting edge technology to American farmers and, and their supporting network. And she's also a partner with her husband on a precision agriculture dealership and cropping farm. Um, she's proud of her professional work, but the real sparkle in her life comes from her one-year-old daughter and her show cows. Uh, you know, Tara, how are you doing today? I'm doing wonderfully, Daryl. How are you today? Hey, I'm doing fantastic. I appreciate you asking. Um, super happy to have you here on the show. I'm glad you asked. What a what a fun activity to do. I love talking to talking to folks like yourself and talking to the market about about what I do and how I view the industry. So, what a neat opportunity. Awesome. Awesome. I, I love that you, uh, you're you saying all that because it is actually really fun to do this too. But uh, just to kind of start, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, I'm hailing from Michigan. Um, my professional work is with NEDAP, which is a publicly traded company on the Dutch Stock Exchange. And we are busy with technologies in a lot of different industries, but I work within our dairy sector. So we are future-proofing dairy farms by revolutionizing cow side care through technologies and activity monitoring, cow locating, milk metering, and identification. So that's our bread and butter, and I spend uh, most of my time doing marketing for NEDAP. Awesome. Awesome. I love hearing you're your, like, quite deep in dairy, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. We have a long history dating back to the 1970s, uh, working in dairy and pioneering some um, tech solutions for the dairy space. So it's, it's deep in our roots um, as a company, as well as for me personally. So it, there's nice alignment there. That's awesome. And, you know, with all that, what would you say are your top three achievements and what did you learn from those experiences? Um, personally, my family, of course. Um, I had uh, my daughter last year. My husband and I were excited to welcome her um, into our family and she's been a breath of fresh air. Um, a huge challenge. Uh, as anybody that has children knows, it is a game changer for what your daily life looks like. Um, but she's just everything and more that we could ever have dreamed of. So I'm, I'm very proud of my family um, and love to, to watch each of my family members grow. So that's a fun, fun part of life for me. That is awesome. Yeah, yeah. I guess a couple of other achievements. You asked me this ahead of time um, to kind of think about it. And it's always awkward to, <laughs> to go down this trail a little bit. But um, one thing that I really enjoy doing is professional development. And um, I actually I'm also very competitive. And so when you can bring those two together, I find a lot of joy in it. And so um, I was competing in a contest called the discussion meet through Farm Bureau a couple of years ago and uh, competed in a regional contest in Michigan. Um, it qualified to go on to state. So I went to the state contest, just kind of curious to see how the contest would go. And I ended up winning it. And so then I ended up going to the national contest. And they run it kind of like March Madness, if you're familiar with basketball. So it's a tournament style and there's all the rounds and you keep advancing. Anyway, so I made it to the Sweet 16 and everybody was really excited. And then I made it to the Final Four and everybody was really excited. And um, we ended up for the Final Four competing before, uh, at the time, President Donald Trump came on stage. So we had a, a packed um, a packed auditorium for our discussion about um, agriculture and profitability for the farmer. And I ended up placing second in the nation. So that was a really, really cool moment for me. Wow. That's, that's incredible. Yeah, it was, it was quite the ride. Let me tell you, it was uh, that national contest was down in new Orleans. And so uh, it was just, it was a really neat trip. And, and because I was representing the state of Michigan, uh, we had a lot of members of Farm Bureau from Michigan and staff, and I had a coaching group and and everybody that was kind of rooting me on throughout the entire contest. And it just was a really, really neat thing to do. And my husband and my parents also ended up being there. So it was cool to have them alongside for the ride. Um, and of course, their favorite part was I ended up winning a Case International tractor, 
So everybody at home was super excited to have me bring a tractor home. <laughs> it, it was win-win all across the board. Exactly. Exactly. Is it structured like a debate tournament or? Well, that's just it. It kind of is, except you don't want to truly debate or you lose points. So it's supposed to emulate uh, boardroom type discussions. So working in a collaborative manner to reach kind of a mutually agreeable solution for the topic given. So you want to you want to propose new information and counter other people's ideas in a constructive way um, and kind of reach reach conclusions that everybody can get on board with. I think that's actually more difficult than a debate uh, <laughs> competition. I think so, too, because in a debate, you can just kind of fire shots and <laughs> one up each other. But with this, you have to you have to work together and get everybody in the boat, which can be challenging. Yeah. Yeah. My daughter's in debate now and uh, she she is ruthless. So nice. <laughs> so, so but that's cool. Congratulations. That's awesome to hear in, in New Orleans. That's a that's a trip as well. <laughs> it was. It was. Yes. So kind of building off that, since your parents and, and basically your family went on kind of that little journey with you, how would your parents describe what you do in your day job? <laughs> um, great, great question there. Uh, I did actually ask my dad a couple of days ago and he said, you're still selling technology, right? <laughs> and I said, dad, I shifted out of being in sales several years ago now. I'm actually on the marketing side of ag tech. And he goes, oh. Okay, well, it's, it's like the same thing then. So <laughs> <laughs> that's coming from the angle of a farmer. Um, so that's kind of, I think, what their what their thought is. But to give maybe some terms that they would uh, describe it as, I think they would say flexible um, because they see me work during the day. They know that I work during the night. They see that I work on the weekend, but then they'll also see that I, you know, pop out and do something else during random times. So um, they know that the work is flexible and I do what needs to be done. I think they would also consider it to be kind of next generation um, what I do sometimes. So uh, as far as the company and the work style and everything, it's it's not what their generation is used to. Gotcha. Yeah, no, I, that makes sense. And I ask everyone this question, right? And everyone has kind of everything's in the same vein is the answer. And And your dad, what a dad answer to begin with. <laughs> I love that. So yeah. changing gears just a little bit here, um, more into like your marketing background and, and yeah. your thoughts there. Um, what changes uh, have you seen in, you know, since digital media and the internet have become really a big part of people's lives? And how do you feel they should be incorporated in a company strategy? Yeah. You know, that's a huge shift that's been going on for many years now. Um, and I've been fortunate to really launch my career as the shift is taking place. So I've been riding that wave. You know, when I first started my career, I think it was still, especially in agriculture, um, predominantly print media was a source of truth, right? And that's where a lot of uh, farmers, which is, you know, the end customer of my business, um, would go for information or finding out what's new. Um, but we've seen some shift there, although agriculture does defy the odds a little bit in those trends. <laughs> Print media is still alive and well. Um, but yeah, the shift to digital marketing and the plethora of uh, ways that you can go about that is exciting, but also really ups the ante for um, having and making the right decisions, I guess, about how to go about it, because there's so much more noise now. There's so much more information that are customers, uh, decision makers, and influencers to people making the buying decision. Um, there's just so much more noise in the in the palm of their hand on a daily basis. So figuring out how to cut through that becomes the challenge. Um, and also, I think there's a really heightened element of skepticism or maybe distrust in the information because we've seen so many... Um, negative things go viral, especially in agriculture. We've seen some uh, attacks on animal ag and, and in the farming community, we know the dishonesty behind, you know, how some of those videos have been manipulated. And there's just a lot of things like that, that I think have created some of that skepticism behind what we see online. And so I think that also makes it that much more difficult um, from a marketing standpoint to figure out how to cut through that. Um, so one of the ways that I've been trying to tackle it within my role 
is to really seize opportunities for collaboration with brands or platforms that are already doing it right and have like-minded targets um, for what we have. And so um, that is, in, in some cases, social influencers that we feel like really represent um, represent kind of the pillars of our brand um, as far as being honest and really working in the trenches at the farm level and, and speaking truth about, about what happens on their farm um, and speaking to farmers, right? And so those are some things that we seek out. Um, we've so- sought out some um, podcast channel collaboration and to really trying to elevate our, our farmers and users stories. Um, and then just looking at platforms that are really targeting the customers that we want to target for conversation. Sure. Now, all of that makes a lot of sense, you know, especially the noise part and, and the challenge there, which kind of brings me to a follow up question. And you kind of touched on a few things that I'm probably going to ask you after this, too. Um, but, you know, you mentioned noise being a big challenge. Um, is that the biggest challenge that you're facing in your marketing and communication role now? Or are there other challenges as well? From an external standpoint, uh, it is it is always a challenge how to cut through it. Right. And actually, you know, because most marketing effort is going to have to a spend behind it. Right. So you have to weigh what is that spend versus what is the payoff going to be? So trying to figure out where that equation kind of the sweet spot in that equation is a challenge. Um, And then also for us, because we're a global company, we're publicly traded, we have pockets in several different markets, working internally to um, kind of get communication aligned amongst our group internally, um, as far as what's new and what stories are that are happening in other parts of the world and what makes sense to, to, you know, to show to our market, what would they relate to. So that's another challenge for us, just because we work around the world and want to showcase the representation we have in different markets, but also make sure that we are relatable to our local market. That makes a lot of sense. You know, um, uh, local markets are different than, than global ones. Um, and, you know, I, I love what you said about aligning the teams um, because I think everywhere it's like that, right? Not, not to throw like a kitchen sort of uh, analogy out there, but the front of the house and the back of the house have to work together. (laughs) So um, you touched on this earlier as well about trust. um, And that's a big thing for us too. And and so my question would be, how do you build that trust or or build that authority and thought leadership in the marketplace? Oh, that's a loaded topic. And I think it it is a constantly evolving and fine tuning effort. Um, One of the, one of the like, just low hanging fruit, basic things that I see a lot of companies still stumbling on that I, I try to continuously try to do right within our organization is, is just imagery. What is the imagery that we're using in our marketing materials? So as an example, there is a sponsored ad that keeps coming up on my Facebook feed by one of our competitors and the cow has, uh, large horns on her head and has a very non-desirable confirmation uh, as a dairy cow. And so every time I see it, I cringe because I'm like, if you know anything about dairy cows and dairy farming, you know that this is not the cow you want in your barn, nor does it represent what our modern farming practices call for. And so um, just little things like that, like to me, that's a turnoff immediately, right? To, to our consumer, because it shows that we don't, we don't know what they do and we don't know what they value. And so I try to make sure that the imagery that we use is always the modern dairy cow with modern environment behind them that appeals to our local market, which is different than other parts of the world. So as an example, if you're in Ireland, most of your photos are going to have cows in a grazing environment, uh, which isn't depictive of the the U.S. Um, dairy environment. So there's just those nuances around the world that we try to be cognizant of. Um, but just really kind of thinking about how is our look and feel um, to the market that we're trying to serve. So that's a big part of it. And then um, as far as just really trying to build that that brand authority and thought leadership, I really try to tap into the expertise of my team. And by team, I mean my experts around the company, not just in marketing, but around the company and other departments as well, because I have a lot of really, really talented people that have um, real expertise in their own lanes within the industry. And I know that they have a story that is needs to be told and information that can be really helpful to the marketplace. And so I tap them to 
um, be the byline, the author for management tip articles or to have speak on podcasts or to present webinars to really uplift their voice and um, show the industry that we have experts um, and the depth of our knowledge goes beyond just the product we're putting into the field, but we've got the team to back it. All of you, what you just said is so true. I mean, not that I would know the difference between a great dairy cow and, and not. I don't come from an egg background, but um, but it, I've certainly had a few conversations about it where the wrong animal is being shown on an advertisement for something that may or may not be for that specific animal. Um, and so being cognizant of that. Let me give you let me give you another analogy on that because I think that everybody would understand this. Okay. <laughs> it would be like if I were trying to market a race car, you know, the the fastest, the sleekest, edgiest race car, and the image I was using was an old rusted out minivan. <laughs> does that does that give the contradiction? <laughs> it, it surely does. The, <laughs> the van down by the river. So, <laughs> um, and I, I love that you 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 want to leverage your experts as well. That's a big thing that we do here, um, and it's important to the market as well because everybody knows each other, and and spreading you know true knowledge and knowledge dissemination is so important. Um, so I, I love that you like to leverage that. I, I, long range high five from me. So, <laughs> um, kind of moving more towards a little bit more personal um, questions, um, kind of in your field and more maybe more opin opinion based. But what do you feel is a common myth in your job right now? Oh, I've heard lots of stuff. Marketing makes pretty brochures. That's what marketing does. Or uh, one of my favorites, marketing's not part of sales. <laughs> yes, those are a couple of hurdles. Um, and honestly, I probably heard those more when I was um, in sales, not on the marketing side, but actually working at, in the sales capacity. So I'm aware from that side of the world sometimes what the view is on marketing. Um, and and those myths, if a company wants to be healthy and wants to have the, the closest pulse on the marketplace, marketing and sales have to be in lockstep and have to work cohesively. So I, I believe strongly in that. And, and one of the things that I, I talk about within my organization and with my upper management is that I consider myself to work uh, our marketing from a grassroots effort. And so I like to be really involved with our sales side of the business, with our technical support side, with what's going on out in the field, because that's where you really get the information of what the customers are saying, what the prospects are saying, why we may be winning or losing deals. You know, that's where you get that information to figure out how to hone your message and be on the cutting edge of what the market trend is. Sure. Yeah. And I love that you were you came from sales, right? And and that's how you transitioned into marketing. Um, and I'm from sales. That's been my entire background. And I know that uh, salespeople can be superstitious and can like to pass the blame to marketing. But I'm I agree with you 100. percent Sales and marketing cannot exist without each other. And when they work together, you have a beautiful, well-oiled machine. And so. Without that, you know, sometimes when I have salespeople tell me stuff like that, it, to me, it's just they're an immature salesperson. They just haven't learned that when you work together, you know, if you help marketing, marketing is going to help you and, and vice versa. And, and the company's better for it. Yeah, it, it, it can definitely come from a point of immaturity. And I, I've also seen it come from a, a point of frustration. If one side or the other isn't pulling their weight or isn't bringing proper value to the equation, then that's where I think sometimes these um, perceptions really get heightened. So if, if marketing knows how to work hand in hand with those other teams and bring mutual value, then I think a lot of those go away and everybody, you know, feels like they're working towards a common goal collectively. I, I couldn't agree more there. Um, did you always want to be a marketer, by the way? Um, it wasn't on my original plan. Uh, so. I, you know, I got my degree in agribusiness coming out of, um, coming out of high school, I went to Michigan State for agbiz and, uh, 
worked in pharm- the pharmaceutical side of agriculture for a while and then pivoted over um, to the technology side uh, in both capacities was predominantly on the sales and application side of that. Um, however, people always told me that I have a natural marketing bend. And I think that goes back to, I, I came from a registered dairy farm. And so my sisters and I made the money that we used to pay for college and buy our car. And, you know, a lot of that came from selling premium genetics. And so we kind of grew up thinking about that value added marketing equation to what kind of matings we were doing with our animals, how we were uh, showing them, presenting them, and then we were selling them. And so I kind of grew up with that built in of how to add value to just a cow and um, be able to to use that to fund the, the things that I needed to fund early in life. And so I think that just kind of instilled a natural thought process towards marketing for me. And then um, as I got going in my career a little bit more, I uh, also pursued my MBA. And through that process, I chose a marketing specialization, which kind of wrapped me forward then into, into the marketing lane afterwards. Sure. No, that's an awesome story that uh, you used your early experience to kind of you know, grow your skills and obviously sales and marketing went hand in hand there. And then that found yourself in marketing after all of that. That's a, that's really cool. Um, kind of in the same lane, maybe going to a different destination. This is an interesting question I like to ask. Um, <clears throat> in your opinion, what do you find is the most important personality trait or strength that someone would need to be successful in your position? There's a lot of different nuances to marketing, and there's a lot of different personality types that can thrive. Um, For me personally, I've leaned into a creative drive, a natural interest in thinking outside of the box, and always looking at the big picture, you know, stepping back to that 30,000 foot view of the moving pieces within our company as well as the moving pieces within the industry and how that all fits together. And that's, that's what I think is important to be a good marketer because you have to call the right shots at the right time. And you have to be, you have to have the chops to really stand behind that sometimes, because in some cases it is going to be pushing people out of their comfort zone. So you you have to be willing to kind of step up and say, this is what we need to do. The market is primed for it. We're primed for it. And it's go time. And people may not be comfortable. You have to figure out how to make them comfortable and then hope that everything comes together the way that you're visioning it will um, in the end. So that sometimes that is not the easy route. But I think if you truly want to be a good marketer, you have to bring that all together. Sure. No, I I, I love kind of like that, not to make it a sports analogy, even though I'm not a sports guy, but kind of like the quarterback, you got to bring the team together. And, and sometimes you have to do, um, you know, hard plays to get the job done. Um, I, I love that, that viewpoint there. And are there any underrated tools that you find are indispensable for you? Underrated tools, I would say, sometimes those industry events going on, you know, you can spend a lot of money really quickly at industry events, trade shows, conferences, etc. Um, and sometimes, you know, sometimes there can be some, some push and pull on whether or not that makes sense. Um, but again, that comes back to, to knowing what's going on in the industry, having that pulse on it and knowing what the right calls are. So as an example, um, we had world dairy expo here this fall and it's, it is a big show, but there has been some shift in recent years, um, of, you know, whether or not the trade show is, is really viable or really a place that that dairy decision makers are going to to do their business. And I think you'll see that in a lot of agriculture and maybe other industries as well. Are trade shows the place to be anymore or is that a changing dynamic? And um, for our business, we do a lot of business to business sales and relationships rather than necessarily business to consumer or end user. And so for us, that show is kind of a meeting grounds of the industry. And we have a lot of those B2B meetings. We have a lot of the the B2B contact. And also for for NEDAP, we don't have, um, we do have an office in North America, but it's not necessarily uh, a place that you would take our agriculture clients to. 
And so I also look at that show in particular as a place where we kind of build that need at branded experience for that see touch feel um, for our customers and prospects to have, because most likely none of them are going to actually step into a brick and mortar need at branded facility at any point. And so taking a lot of that into account, um, I did have to fight a few battles going into that show this year on whether or not it was relevant for us to be there. And after we got through the show, I think it was a resounding yes from our stakeholders within the organization that it was a very successful event for us. Um, but it's just one of those things where you got to know, you got to see that 30,000 foot view and know which play to call. And so afterwards, everybody said, absolutely, we need to be there. Absolutely, we need to be there in the future. And the way that we executed it was the reason that we need to be there. So th- those are just things that, you know, you have to you have to keep a pulse on and you have to make sure that you strive for excellence in that execution in order to get value from them. Sure, sure. Yeah. <clears throat> to add to the, the conferences thing, you know, I kind of seen the same thing and, and heard the same thing in, in other industries as well. Um, but, you know, being primarily B2B as well, without like a home office that anybody is ever going to see. I look at it the same way as, as you do it. It's a meeting grounds where we can shake hands and, and talk and build the relationship, which I feel is really important, especially in, in the ag side. Oh, for um, sure. So I'm, 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 I, I'm going to steal your view. I'm glad you can see the 30,000 feet view as well. <laughs> um, kind of going into the closing here, just a, a few more questions for you. What is a piece of advice that you would give someone starting out in their career, kind of following your footsteps? Say yes. And I, and there, I say that because there's a lot of different, sometimes seemingly little and sometimes very big opportunities that may come across. And I think sometimes young people are a little bit rigid in approaching those or maybe just have trouble conceptualizing them. I know when I was coming out of school, I had several different offers and there was only one that actually could tell me geographically where I was going to live. Mm -hmm. The others all said, we want to put you through our, you know, corporate sales program and we'll send you somewhere in the United States once we get through it. And we can't tell you where that's going to be. We can't tell you exactly which product line you're going to be working on. We just want you to come drink the Kool-Aid and go through our program. And, you know, <laughs> and I mean, they were big opportunities. They were big opportunities with big brands and and nice um, compensation packages. But it was really hard to to say yes to the gray area. And so I actually ended up choosing um, the one offer that I had that said I was going to go to Wisconsin. So I knew, okay, I have roughly a zip code of where I'm going to live. Um, and for me, that was important because I still owned, owned cattle with my family and wanted to be able to come home and help with the farm. So that was a, a driving force for me. And I don't regret any of the decisions I've made. I've had some really neat things happen within my career. Um, but, you know, you have to be willing to say yes to to movement, sometimes geographically, sometimes, you know, into positions that you're not comfortable with. Um, sometimes it's even just saying yes when somebody says, "Hey, do you want to do you want to join our kickball league?" So I recently had a con. When I lived in Wisconsin, give you a backstory. When I lived in Wisconsin, uh, somebody was like, "Hey, I got this kickball league going on Tuesday nights or whatever. We need another player." And I said, "Sure, I'll join." And it was just a, a fun time. Now we fast forward about ten years later, and um, a trade show that I recently did has a new manager of the show and turns out it was the guy that coordinated this kickball team I was part of. And the show is notoriously difficult to deal with. It's hard to get a good booth space. It's hard to, it's hard to work with them. So now all of a sudden I got a buddy from kick kickball back in the day who's running the show and was, is, you know, very friendly and, and open to the ideas I have and possibly moving us to a better location and, and a lot of nice things. So <laughs> I say that there's a lot of pieces of life that may come up in ways unexpected. And I just recommend to young people that you say yes, that you jump in and you just never know where, um, where those moments, opportunities, experiences will take you. So just have an open mind. Perfect. <clears throat> That's such great advice. Um, I, I have teenagers and I wish they would say yes to more things. They're uh, uh, I'm speaking very generally and, and even their friends are, but they're very, uh, I feel like they're more timid than I was at their age. 
Um, and so saying yes and kind of doing what's uncomfortable is, is really where a, a lot is there. And uh, the, the kickball league thing cracks me up because all I could think of was when you were telling me that is I know a guy. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And, and it works out and you're, you're so right. You never know where those puzzle pieces are going to fall. Um, so great story there. Uh, if you could be remembered for one thing, Tara, what would it be? Pushing the boundaries, pushing the envelope, pushing people out of their comfort zone. Um, I like to do that in my personal life. And I like to do that professionally as well, because I believe that excellence is really achieved in that that sweet spot, that final kind of couple percentage points of effort um, that a lot of people don't necessarily get to. And so being willing to go the extra mile and and push outside of what's been done before I think is where the real magic moments are found. I, I agree with you. And you've mentioned that several times today about kind of going into the uncomfortable. Um, and I love that you've done that. Uh, I, I'm going to guess maybe you would write a book about that tomorrow. But if you did write a book tomorrow, what would you write it about? <laughs> um, I, I, I could, yes. <laughs> I, I may be known as a pusher. And so <laughs> that, that may be one. Um, another one though, uh, maybe didn't come out as much of this conversation, but, uh, you know, I came, I grew up through a, a family farm, multi generational farm. Um, and that's what our community was, was a lot of multi-generational farms. And I've seen some of them be really successful. And I've seen some be very dysfunctional um, just because of the workload and demand that happens at the farm on a regular basis. And then the challenges um, financially with being such a such an asset heavy um, and liqui- liquidity light type of a business structure. And um so I think there's just a lot of really interesting stories about agriculture and the American farmer, um, especially kind of being the backbone of our country uh, and, and the heroes within um, that sometimes people don't necessarily know about. So I think that would be probably where I would want to to write a book. Yeah, no, I would love to read a book about that. Um, you know, I, I said earlier that I don't come from ag. Um, but the more I learn about it, the more I would have loved to know about it as I was coming up through school, because it's so much deeper than I had imagined based on what I was told and what I saw. Um, but your book title should be, I may be known as a pusher for sure. <laughs> um, last question for you, Tara, where can our listeners find you online? Uh, I personally am present on Facebook, LinkedIn, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Snapchat. Um, if you want to find me, Tara Baker and NEDAP, uh, is found on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter, uh, NEDAP Livestock Management, uh, NEDAP Dairy Farming. So please come follow myself and our company, um, and hear what we're up to. Awesome. Well, Tara, thank you so much again for being on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure visiting with you. Yeah, likewise. Likewise. And everyone else, thank you for listening. Again, this is the WiseNetic Podcast, and we're signing off. The journey of a hero has challenges, battles, and villains. But after the fight is won, new paths are open. And it's time to catch our breath and move forward. More powerful and super than ever. And you, hero of the swine industry, do you have your cape ready to take new flights? Swine Talks 2023, December 6th and 7th. Together, we're more super than any obstacle.